What's going on guys, this is Rob, and in this video I'm gonna do everything I can to turn you guys into an expert on the character of Michael Morbius from Marvel Comics. Yes, Morbius the Living Vampire. So Morbius was first created by Roy Thomas and Gil Kane and first appeared in Amazing Spider-Man number 101 in 1971. Now here's the funny thing about this. There was an interview that was done actually last year in November of 2020 with Steve Biscotti, and I hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. <laughs> but Steve had actually talked to Roy Thomas about the idea of the movie that was coming out different things like that. And of course, as usually happens in those interviews, Roy Thomas offered a little bit of history there in terms of the creation of Morbius. And what he stated here is that for a lot of his life, Roy Thomas really enjoyed the old monster stuff, old monster movies, things like that. Dracula played by Christopher Lee and so on. But one of the things that he really enjoyed was an old black and white film that came out around 1957 called The Vampire. Now, unlike traditional stories that dealt with Dracula, this was a guy who just had to consume human blood in order to survive. So he wasn't really called Dracula per say, but he kind of fit the mold of what you would expect from a vampire. But this concept was rolled over into the character of Michael Morbius, who of course, Roy Thomas only wrote for a couple of issues. Now, in Spider-Man 101 and 102, the way this worked is this actually came hot off the heels of a story where Spider-Man had tried to cure himself of being Spider-Man and ended up growing six arms in the process. <laughs> <laughs> or I guess growing four additional arms, so he had six in total. And the idea was to try to find some way to bring this to an end. Now, during that point in time, Roy Thomas kind of segued into the nature of Morbius by basically having Peter Parker just kind of remove himself from his involvement with like Gwen Stacy and J. Jonah Jameson and all those guys. And he actually hit up Kurt Connors, the lizard, to basically find a place where he could lay low. Of course, he was given Kurt Connors' house in the Southamptons. Now, one of the things that you will probably notice over the course of the coming months with regards to the Morbius film is that you you will likely end up hearing people talk about things like if the lizard does appear in like Spider-Man 3, that you might see references to Michael Morbius with regards to Kirk Connors himself. The reason why is because if that's the case, the history of Kirk Connors and, and Michael Morbius are actually very, very important. The motivation behind this was the fact that with Michael Morbius himself, as far as his story went, we weren't given an origin story in his first appearance. Instead, all that really happened is that he was just kind of a guy who sort of looked like a, looked like a bat to a degree and he was essentially on a ship. Now, of course, this basically led to the sailors trying to get rid of him. He jumped aboard, they thought he drowned. And so when they went to sleep that night, Michael Morbius came back looking the way you normally expect to see him, right? Very, very pale, the vampire type appearance and actually fed on those guys. Now, one of the things that Roy Thomas did here, which was genius in terms of how he handled Morbius is that Roy Thomas was very, very good when it came to character development. More so than that, creating circumstances that would make you very sympathetic to the characters. And so once Michael Morbius had feasted on the sailors, there was a lot of regret there in terms of what he did. It wasn't just like, oh man, I've finally got a full belly. Cool, let's go find the next folks. Instead, he hated doing that. So in a lot of ways, it mirrored the dichotomy between like Bruce Banner and the Incredible Hulk, right? The fact that Banner hated being the Hulk, Hulk hated Banner. It was very similar to this. Of course, it wasn't really a multiple personality disorder kind of thing with Michael Morbius, but the fact that he had to basically kill people in order to live was something he absolutely despised about himself. And so what ends up happening here is that you end up having Michael Morbius who actually finds the place where Spider-Man is, is crashing at that house and then basically goes in there. Right at the moment when he's about to feast on Spider-Man, Kirk Connors shows up and then a kind of fight breaks out between Kirk Connors and Morbius, which of course happens in uh, Amazing Spider-Man number 102. Now, in that particular story, and the reason why things were so important when it came to the lizard is because there comes a point when during the conflict, Michael Morbius actually bites Kirk Connors. And when that happens, it actually transforms him or at least partially back into Kirk Connors Connors himself. And so the indication there is that whatever is in the blood of Michael Morbius would actually have the ability to basically cure Kirk Connors. Now, that was always a big focus point when it came to the lizard, the idea of finding a way to turn Kirk Connors back into his normal self. Because remember, the whole motivation of him becoming the lizard in the first place was trying to find a way to regrow his missing arm. Of course, with Peter Parker having uh, six arms now, whatever was in Morbius's blood that could presumably cure Kirk Connors could also cure him. And so what it actually turned into, instead of some kind of traditional story where you saw Morbius basically escaping Spider-Man and Kirk Connors and then going on some kind of a killing spree or something like that. He was actually just trying to avoid them. He was trying to avoid being caught by Spider-Man and, and Connors. Now, it wasn't as though they were going to like, you know, kill him and then dissect him or anything like that. What they were actually looking for was a blood sample. Of course, Morbius wouldn't necessarily let them have that. By the time he got to the end of issue number 102, this kind of fight that had taken place between Morbius and Spider-Man, the fact that Morbius was able to hold his own against against both Spider-Man and Kirk Connors was one, an indication to fans, this guy's pretty tough. And two, Spider-Man ultimately got his hands on the serum and then basically cured himself. But the big
biggest thing that was kind of interesting here, and the reason why Roy Thomas had stated that he always wanted to write more of Michael Morbius is because at this point in time in the 1970s in comics, and we've talked about this before, it's not like it is now. Marvel can make a story right now and then given reaction on social media and probably within a few weeks, they would know whether or not it was well received. Back then, you had to go through a combination of sales and letters pages. So it could take a couple months before you actually knew whether or not a character was interesting. And so while Marvel didn't necessarily bring Michael Morbius directly back into the Spider-Man comics, what they did is they rolled him into Marvel Team Up. Of course, we'll talk about that here in a second, but as to the origin of Michael Morbius, uh, the idea here is that he was basically this just kind of genius scientist, right? He had achieved the Nobel Prize and so on, but he was struggling with a degenerative illness, right? An illness that was quite literally breaking down his blood cells. And so in an effort to find a way to essentially cure himself, he started meddling with vampire bats, different things like that, and actually tried an experiment that essentially used electricity to create blood cells, something that had never truly been tried before. The biggest issue with this is that he and his friend Nikos just never really had time to actually work on the process, right? They never really perfected it, anything like that. The whole thing was really based on desperation. And so where the initial experiment was undertaken and there seemed to be no real immediate change regarding Morbius, what this did is it actually led to him, one, believing that the lights were exceedingly bright. So of course he was kind of put in a, uh, in a deprivation cell. And then two, once his friend came back the next morning, he was immediately attacked by Morbius. Now that's one of the things that again, Roy Thomas focused on here is that where Nikos was basically killed by Morbius, it was immediately regret. He was basically overtaken by urge as opposed to actually trying to kill uh, Nikos himself, right? It wasn't really his intention there. The other part of this is that Martine had basically been there, of course, being the love interest of Michael Morbius. And so in realizing he had killed Nikos, he effectively took off in the hopes that he wouldn't come back and kill, uh, kill Martine instead. And so the result of this is that he just kind of left her on her own. And then of course, jumping into the water and just kind of being overwhelmed by thirst had come across those sailors. And that basically led into him encountering Spider-Man in issue number 101. Now where Roy Thomas's work on the original presentation of Morbius was important insofar as it crafted the backstory of the character and gave us an idea of what he was about, the Marvel team-up stories by Jerry Conway in issues three through four were probably the most important stories dealing with Michael Morbius. And the reason why is because there were a couple things that happened here. The first is that we got this kind of... I guess, presentation of Michael Morbius insofar as how he compares to other people that are out there. So a really good example of this is you basically ended up learning that when Martine had gone through and looked through all the documentation that Michael Morbius had following him leaving her behind on the boat, Jerry Conway did a little more explanation as far as the details of the experiment he had underwent. That where Roy Thomas had kind of skimmed over it and just chalked it up to an experiment gone wrong, that Jerry Conway had actually established the attempt of Michael Morbius was to create an enzyme that would basically basically create more cells and essentially rid him of this uh, degenerative blood illness. Of course, it went awry, he became Michael Morbius. Following that, Martine discovered that Michael Morbius and Reed Richards of the Fantastic Four had been in contact, which led her to meet with the Fantastic Four. During that discussion, Johnny Storm had recalled a conversation he'd had with Spider-Man, where Spider-Man had said that he'd faced off against a guy by the name of Morbius. Another thing you end up learning is that Morbius' former colleague was a guy named Dr. Jorgensen, and so this was was basically a scenario where Jerry Conway was building up to this idea that because Michael Morbius needed to cure himself, he was going after his former colleague who would basically develop a serum to cure Michael Morbius of what we could call his vampirism. And so that laid the groundwork for the unified direction of where Spider-Man and, uh, and Human Torch were both meeting up at. But then you also end up learning that Jorgensen was actually a colleague of Professor Charles Xavier of the X-Men. And so because Morbius had gone after, uh, you know, Xavier's former colleague, Xavier sent the X-Men to basically try to find a way to stop uh, Michael Morbius. And so this basically led to Morbius being exposed through various conflicts to again, Spider-Man, as well as encountering Johnny Storm and then meeting the X-Men. And while I wouldn't say he overpowered every single person, Jerry Conway wrote it in such a way to where Michael Morbius was able to survive an encounter with pretty much all of them. And so while it doesn't seem like the most impressive thing ever, for a character who had been introduced about six months beforehand, that's pretty wild, right? 
normally you don't see that. Normally you don't see a character, at least in the 1970s anyway, that's introduced and then within a matter of months overpowers several superhero teams. It doesn't usually work that way, but the important thing here is it proved to be very popular for the character of Michael Morbius. Fans latched on. They loved the idea. Of course, the reason why it was written in Marvel Team Up as opposed to Amazing Spider-Man was because Marvel didn't want to risk it, right? Marvel didn't want to take a story that might not do well when in turn they could just build on the Spider-Man mythos and just kind of go in a little more of the direction they'd been going in and ensure strong sales, right? So it's just one of those things they just didn't want to take the risk on potentially losing money on what was in effect a cash cow. <laughs> and so the Marvel Team Up stories, again, because they were so popular, we started to see a whole lot more of Michael Morbius. But the second reason why issues three through four of Marvel Team Up were so important is because they introduced the idea that if Michael Morbius bites somebody, they can become a vampire, which really brought him more in line in traditional vampire themes. Now, I don't really have any recollection or I don't have any, any information to indicate whether or not Roy Thomas was on board with that, if it kind of pissed him off because he didn't really want Michael Morbius to be just a vampire as we knew. But regardless of how you slice it, that proved to be a pretty cool concept. Now, depending on who you talk to, some people will say this is when Michael Morbius's stories got a little wonky and, and there's room to make that argument. The reason why is because what Marvel ended up doing following the Marvel team up stories is they actually rolled him over into a series that was referred to as Adventure into Fear. Now, Adventure into Fear was a comic book line that ran between 1970 and 1975. If anything, it initially started out for the first nine issues as basically reprints of monster-based stories that Marvel had been writing before Marvel became like a publisher of superheroes. So really during the days when Marvel was known as Atlas Comics, but like Journey into Mystery, Tales to Astonish, Strange Tales, a lot of those old monster type comics, those are basically reprinted in the first nine issues. With issue number 10, Adventure into Fear basically became a Man-Thing story. Of course, Man-Thing being a guardian for the portal to the multiverse in the Florida Everglades. And then with issue number 20, running until issue number 31, it became stories focusing on Michael Morbius. Now, the reason why I say it was a little bit wonky is because by and large, the only thing that really came out of it that was significant was that Martine was basically bitten and turned into a vampire. But you had some pretty wild stuff, right? It turned into what was essentially an interdimensional story where you had a guy by the name of Reverend Damon, who was basically the leader of a group called the Caretakers of Arcturus, which was really Arcturus 4. But essentially they were a race of genetic specialists that belonged or at least were involved in a race called the Fortescuans. Some of you guys may recall that we talked about them before. They were basically a race that was contacted by the Beyonders and were essentially responsible for creating humanity and pretty much all the alien races that exist in Marvel Comics. Of course, that's old hat and none of that really applies anymore. At the time it was relevant, but by and large, what you basically saw was Michael Morbius and Martine and then eventually Blade teaming up to basically fight uh, Reverend Damon. And then of course they ended up coming out on top and the day was essentially saved. I wouldn't say that story is significant. I wouldn't, I would say that if you could kind of ignore it regarding the entire history of Michael Morbius and aside from the fact that he encountered Blade, that Blade initially wanted to kill him. And then the two of them realized that basically Michael Morbius's situation wasn't so much that he was an actual vampire, so much as a guy who had just been transformed from an experiment gone wrong and that Martine became a vampire. It's the only real things to take away from it. Now between 1975 at the end of Bill Mantlo and Steve Gerber's work on Adventure into Fear going into Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man number 38, you saw a few things going on with Michael Morbius. One of the coolest things that you saw take place was actually him joining the Legion of Monsters. In reality, this was the precursor to the Midnight Suns. Now the Midnight Suns wouldn't really become a thing until the Ghost Rider comics of 1992, but the Legion of Monsters was cool for it was. And in fact, it was basically a coming together of like Werewolf by Night and like Morbius the Living Vampire and so on. So for the most part, the roster of what would become the Midnight Suns, all in an attempt to basically cure themselves or to be cured of their various illnesses. Now, of course, it didn't really work, but Marvel, I would say, probably didn't quite know what to do with that concept. And so, of course, they just ended up disbanding relatively quickly. But following that, with Marvel 2-in-1 issue number 15, Peter Parker's Spectacular Spider-Man issue 7 and 8, you saw these different stories with Morbius the Living Vampire, where he was involved in different escapades, transported to Dimension Z, different things along those lines. But all that basically came to a head in Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man, issue number 38 in 1980. And what you actually ended up seeing was this story basically taking place whereby Morbius had essentially been cured of his vampirism through like a freak lightning storm. Now, I have to believe, because I can't really find anything to solidify one way or the other, I have to believe that one of the big motivations behind this, or seemingly the big motivation behind this, is that there didn't seem to be a lot of interest in Morbius the Living Vampire, or if there was, it just didn't really, it seemed to be maybe trending in the wrong 
direction? At this point, I'm guessing. I have no real indication as to why it was the case. There's no interviews, no nothing, right? It's just Morbius the Living Vampire essentially became human. What Marvel did is they actually transitioned him over to a combination of different stories. So he appeared in like Savage She-Hulk issue number nine and then 11 through 12. He was in Fantastic Four 266 through 268, West Coast Avengers five and six. But for about nine years, he was basically working with Spider-Woman. He was working with the West Coast Avengers. He was just kind of there in human form, being kind of bounced around as somewhat of like a scientific mind to these various individuals. But by 1989, Roy Thomas had basically been brought back when he was writing Doctor Strange, the Sorcerer Supreme. And so in issue number 10, he actually ended up returning Michael Morbius to being the living vampire. Now, a lot of this came by way of this guy named Victor, who turned out to be the brother of Doctor Strange, who is an actual vampire. It was a little wonky the way that it happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, but I would also say some of you guys may have heard of Victor Strange. You may know him by a different name. He went by Baron Blood for a little while, but I would say over the course of Doctor Strange, Sorcerer Supreme issues 14, 15, 17, and 18 in 1990, running up through Spider-Man issues 13 to 14 in 1991, Morbius was just kind of there and doing a few things. The Spider-Man stories in particular were interesting because you actually end up learning that Spider-Man tracks down these beings that are called subhumans, which are basically people living in the sewers, not that different from the Morlocks, and taking victims for their masters, you end up basically learning that Michael Morbius is the one leading these guys and that Michael Morbius is taking these victims so he can essentially feed on them. But all this got really, really cool and Michael Morbius actually seemed to really find a place for himself when you went into Morbius the Living Vampire number one in 1992. Now that was kind of a tie-in series for an existing story involving this group that was called the Nine, basically supernatural beings that were destined to stop this person named Lilith who was gonna release this demonic being by the name of Zerathos. But with these nine individuals coming together, what you basically got was a story arc that was called The Rise of the Midnight Suns. It was great. <laughs> <laughs> I love the Midnight Suns. Absolutely love those comics back in the day. They were like everything right with comics of the 1990s. I don't know if I'm in the minority. I know a lot of people don't like the Midnight Suns, but essentially it was like Michael Morbius and it was Ghost Rider and all these different guys, right? Like the Darkhold Redeemers, the Night Stalkers. It was really, really cool, right? It was a great concept. The idea behind it really seemed to fit directly into the idea of Michael Morbius in the sense that as you were going into like the, the early 1990s, with stories that were coming out like X-Force and X-Men Volume 2 and so on and so forth, stories had gotten a lot more dark, but they had also become a lot more action-packed and fast-paced. And so this basically led to what was the kind of horror side of Marvel experiencing something akin to a resurgence. The reason why I say this is that between 1991 and 1993, specifically when it came to Doctor Strange Sorcerer Supreme issue number 53, you actually saw a point where Nightmare took over the body of Doctor Strange and Morbius had to free Doctor Doctor Strange. Of course, that took place in a story called A Nightmare on Bleecker Street. But over the course of these various stories, it was phenomenal to see that like Michael Morbius was finally kind of getting a place in the realm of Marvel Comics, finally getting this kind of spot for himself where he could basically fit in. Not only that, while I wouldn't say that he became a hero, I'd say he became more of an anti-hero to a degree where he promised to basically feed on the blood of those individuals who committed crimes, who were basically villains. And so in one of the cooler contributions that he had, it was actually Morbius who joined Spider-Man and a whole bunch of people to essentially stop Carnage during the events of Maximum Carnage. Now, at this point, my knowledge on Morbius is a little lacking. <laughs> I want to say that he had disappeared for a while. I don't remember if that's entirely true. I know he was present during the events of Civil War, but ultimately he ended up joining Armor, which was basically the alternate reality monitoring and operational response. Essentially, think of it like S.H.I.E.L.D., except they monitor alternate universes. He was part of that organization for for a little while. How deep that went, I don't recall off the top of my head. I wanna say that it was basically him being involved in like the Marvel Zombies storylines, which was a little bit weird. He was involved with bringing back like Frank Castle when he was, uh, well really, I guess Frankencastle, when Frank Castle the Punisher became like Frankenstein-esque more or less. He did lead his own Midnight Suns team for a little while, but I do recall that during the events of like Spider Island and all that kind of stuff, that there was one point when he had been working in Horizon Labs during Dan Slott's run, uh, ultimately he was operating as somebody called Number Six, which was basically just this guy that kept a hazmat suit on so nobody would really know what was going on. In reality, it was just kind of Dan Slott having him there. There were a few instances where he was
was involved in some bigger storylines, but overall, the gist of Michael Morbius was very much what it always had been, which was trying to find some way to cure himself of his vampirism. But by and large, as far as I'm aware, the role of Michael Morbius during really going into like the, the mid to late 2000s up until the modern day is nowhere near what it used to be, right? Nowhere near as popular as it used to be. It wasn't as intense. You didn't have things like the massacre of the Midnight Suns or anything along those lines. You didn't really have anything on that level. Instead, while I would say that Morbius had largely been a background character for quite some time in Marvel Comics in the sense that he kind of had his own solo run for a little while, but he never really had the same level of prominence as like the X-Men or the Incredible Hulk or like Iron Man or somebody like that, that even the role he had under Dan Slott seemed to be far more minimal than any of the roles that he had had before. But again, as it stands right now, he still exists. He's still there. He's still out doing a few things here and there, but his role's not nearly as popular as it was. So I do apologize for the latter half of this. My knowledge is a little bit lacking when it comes to him. Uh, so I guess I can't make you a full-fledged expert. Hopefully it doesn't kill my credibility. <laughs> <laughs> but I will say that because of the history of Michael Morbius over the course of Marvel Comics, specifically in relation to Spider-Man and a lot of the characters that he has faced off against, he's one of those legacy characters. He's one of those iconic characters that has just been around for so long and had so many adventures in different capacities in Marvel Comics. He'll never lose popularity among comic book readers. There will probably never come a time when no one's ever heard of Michael Morbius just because of the role he plays, at least within the comic book community. If you're some soccer mom out there, you'd probably never heard of him until you saw the trailer for the movie. <laughs> but beyond that, when it comes to comic book readers, he will always hold a role there. So with that being said, guys, we're gonna bring this video to an end. Again, I do apologize for the latter half. I should know more about Morbius than I do. It's just, I guess I haven't really stayed current on him. Uh, but thank you guys for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.